Hello to everyone. Uh, welcome to our lecture series devoted to the role of cultural diplomacy in written correspondence, the virtue of peace in official and informal letters from the Levant from antiquity to the present day. Uh, the interdisciplinary lectures we explore as a project of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Levant Culture and Civilization cover the fields of history, political sciences, literature, philosophy, religious studies, and the history of arts, and deal with selected texts with particular attention to letters and other texts of historical value that incorporate concepts of cultural diplomacy, mediation, and peace. We are very pleased to welcome our today's speaker, uh, Sam uh, Ottowil Salsby from the University of Cambridge. He studied the history at the, at the University of York and then at, at the University of Cambridge, culminating in a PhD on Carolingian diplomacy with the Islamic world, 2017. 2017. Currently, um, Dr. Otto Will Salsby is a postdoctoral research associate working for the ERC founded Impact of the Ancient City project based in the Faculty of Classics at the University of Cambridge, where he considers the influence of Greek or Roman ideas of the city on su subsequent con concepts of urbanism. Beyond his engagement in the new project, Dr. Sam Ottowil Salsby remained deeply interested in Carolingian relations with the Islamic world, and he had published on concepts of holy war in Charlemagne's empire, the uses of ap apocalyptic writing in understanding the reign of Harun al-Rashid, and on the importance of camels for medieval political thought. Dr. Ottowil Salsby will introduce us today in a fascinating topic, Charlemagne's Asian elephant, India in Carolingian uh, Abbasid relations. Dear Dr. Atawil Salisbury, thank you for accepting the invitation. Now the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for you know, such a, a wonderfully kind uh, in, introduction. So before I go any further, I'll just check that you can you can all hear me. Um, you can, all, you can all, all hear me perfectly fine. And if that I shall now attempt to share to share screen the um, Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, hopefully you should uh, you should you should now you should now my uh, my, uh, my PowerPoint presentation here. Yes, this works wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. In which, in which case, I yeah, I'd like I'd like to thank the Institute for Advanced Studies in Levant Culture and Civilization for inviting me to participate in this series, and particularly Catalan Stefan. For, it's it's good to know that even as disease keeps us from traveling, we can still reach out to each other in in, the, in this way. Speaking as a citizen of an island that is facing an uncertain future after having made the perhaps ill-advised decision to cut itself off from its closest neighbours, it gives me great comfort to be able to talk to you all today. So in October 801, an elephant arrived in the town of Porto Veneri in Liguria, Italy, having travelled over the Mediterranean from North Africa. His name was Abulabas. He and his handlers spent the winter in Vercelli before crossing the Alps and heading north. On the 20th July, they arrived at Aachen in modern Germany, where the elephant was greeted by his new owner, Charlemagne. Charlemagne was the most powerful ruler in Western Europe, king of the Franks and the Lombards, and had been crowned emperor by the Pope in Rome a year and a half before Abulabas arrived at his capital. Abulabas was a present from one of the few monarchs in Eurasia mightier than Charlemagne, the Abbasid Caliph, Harun al-Rashid. In 797, Charlemagne had sent an embassy to Harun asking him for an elephant. With the exception of their, of their guide, Isaac the Jew, the envoys all perished, but Isaac succeeded in his mission in spectacular fashion. Abulabas was an instant celebrity, you know, and a fixture of Charlemagne's court until his death in 810, while on campaign against the Saxons in northern Germany. In 825, the Irish monk Dicuil remembered the excitement that he caused and the crowds of people who came to visit him. Long after both Abulabas and Charlemagne had died and the empire had collapsed, they were remembered together. When Charlemagne's tomb was opened in the later century, 
The people who disturbed the emperor's rest wrapped his body in a silk shroud dominated by images of elephants. In recent years, academic monographs and children's books alike have celebrated the elephant of Charlemagne. Charlemagne's diplomacy with Harun al-Rashid has long fascinated scholars, but explaining why it happened is a difficult task. There are few Arabic sources for their dealings and none which straightforwardly explain the caliph's motives, so we are dependent on Frankish evidence, which while numerous is not always particularly forthcoming. Historians have generally assumed that something else was going on behind the scenes, ascribing their dealings to military or economic or religious motivations. And the last of these has something to it. Charlemagne was interested in the Holy Land and Jerusalem in particular, and sent gifts to the patriarch there while sponsoring buildings. But these developments you know, all came later after the Frankish ruler sent a second embassy to Harun al-Rashid in 802. Charlemagne's father and Harun's grandfather had exchanged embassies, but there were, that was three decades earlier and nothing had happened in the meantime to connect them. Perhaps the best evidence for what Charlemagne was up to comes from the biography written by his courtier, Einhard. Einhard writes that Harun al-Rashid sent Charlemagne an elephant because Charlemagne asked for it. And I think we can pause here for a moment to admire the confidence with which Charlemagne sent an embassy to a ruler he had never contacted before to ask him for, for an elephant. What I want to suggest today is that we take Einhard's testimony seriously here and accept that Charlemagne got in touch with Harun because he wanted an elephant. With that in mind, the rule of us suddenly becomes very important. Rather than becoming a colorful afterthought, he, uh, he instead becomes a central part of the way we think about diplomacy between the Carolingians and the Abbasids. Today, I want to talk about something that I think hasn't really received enough attention, which is the question of where exactly Abulabas came from. In the remainder of my time, I intend to do three things. First, I want to convince you that Abulabas was an, an Asian elephant born and raised in India. Second, I want to think about how that changes our impression of what Harun al-Rashid was up to when, the, when, uh, when he sent Charlemagne an elephant. And third, I, I will argue that Charlemagne and his court were fully aware that Abu Abbas came from India and that this was an important part of their thinking about him. So let's begin at the beginning. As we all know, there are several species of elephants. We can narrow down our options for which one Abu Abbas was relatively quickly. He was not a North African elephant of the type used by Hannibal against Rome because they were extinct by the seventh century at the latest. That leaves the Asian elephants and two African subspecies, the African bush elephants and the African forest elephants. It has recently been suggested that Abu Abbas was an African elephant. He first appears in our sources when he and his handlers arrived in what is now Tunisia. We know that things did move from Sub-Saharan Africa to the Mediterranean in this period. We know there were trading routes crossing the Sahara over lands, connecting the Mediterranean with the forests of West Africa, while ships carried cargo from the East African coast to the Red Sea. Further evidence for an African origin comes from a splendid early 9th century ivory plaque depicting the Virgin Mary, now in the Met in New York. Ivory was an important part of Carolingian arts. Most of it was Roman ivory being reused in later centuries, but this plaque demonstrates that at least one piece of new African ivory was available in Aachen in the early ninth century. The plaque is too large to have come from one of the smaller Asian elephants, and the radiocarbon dating has demonstrated that it's not ancient ivory being, being reused. Because it is so unusual to have new ivory in this period, it has been argued that this must have come from a Bulabas after he dies, and therefore that he must have been an African elephant. There are, however, a couple of reasons to challenge this. Writing a few decades later, the poet Florus of Lyon describes Isaac and the elephant following the African coast of, of the Mediterranean, which might rule out the idea that a Bulabas crossed the Sahara. More telling are the great difficulties with domesticating African elephants. In the 10th century, the Muslim writer Al Masudi observed that while African elephants produced excellent ivory, they were impossible to train. And this seems to be the consensus in the medieval caliphates. 
It therefore seems very unlikely that Harun al-Rashid would have been able to send Charlemagne an, an African elephant, or that it would even have, have occurred to him to try. All the elephants used in the caliphate were Asian elephants, and because of this, it seems pretty certain that Abul Abbas was an Asian elephant. This is quite important because elephants were not native to the lands that Harun al-Rashid rules. Elephants were very rare in the caliphates. Al-Masudi reports that many courtiers had tried to earn favor by breeding elephants and failed. Crowds formed when a small herd you know, were brought to Basra in the early 8th century. They had to be acquired from India. We know from pre-modern Indian elephant manuals that the animals were normally the possession of kings. All elephants are extremely expensive to keep because they need a huge amount of food. Baby elephants need less food and, and have the advantage of being cute, but can't be put to work and they still eat a lot. Because of this, kings in India normally kept specially managed forests for wild elephants, with people keeping an eye on them. If they were needed, they were normally captured when they were about 20 years old, so their training could begin. This means that Abul Abbas, who died in northern Germany, probably spent at least the first decades of his life in, in India. And I think this is really exciting because it makes the geographical scale on which we're working even larger th than it already was. But it also means that we need to add an extra set of questions to our thinking about Abul Abbas as we try to understand the implications of his, under of his origins in India. So I'm now moving to the second section of my talk where, where I ask how this, this changes our understanding of Harun's motivations and actions in these relations with Charlemagne. I will divide them into two subsections, the first of which argues that getting an elephant was a difficult thing to do, and the, and the, and the, cal the caliph was therefore passing with a very scarce resource. The second considers the significance of India for Abbas and thoughts. So how did Harun al-Rashid come to acquire Abul Abbas? None of the Arabic sources mention him, or indeed that Harun had any elephants, which means that any solution we come to is going to have to be speculative. One of our problems here is, is the timing. Our sources from the period suggest that elephants could easily live up to 70 years, meaning that Abul Abbas could have been born any time from about 740, a decade before Harun's family seized power in the caliphates. We may be able to narrow that down a little bit. If we assume that Abul Abbas was captured at the normal age of 20, then the earliest he could have arrived in the caliphate is about 760. That still leaves a possible 40 years when Abul Abbas could have come into the possession of the Abbasids. Elephants were royal animals in India. As well as being symbols of power and status, they were also an essential part of warfare in the subcontinents. While there are occasional hints of commerce and trade in elephants, for the most part, their population seem to have been controlled by kings, who spent a great deal of time and resources in acquiring enough of them for their armies. This suggests two ways Abul Abbas could have arrived in the caliphates, either as a gift from an Indian ruler or as booty from warfare. To deal with the diplomatic route first, elephants were not common gifts. The Indian manuals counsel kings against giving them as gifts because they were weapons that, that might be used against you. In the event that you did give a foreign ruler an elephant, it should be an elderly one, one that couldn't be used against you. If this was how Abul Abbas came to the caliphate, then this might suggest a later date for his arrival, as well as hinting that Abul Abbas might not have died because of Frankish neglects, but from simple old age. We know that Indian kings did sometimes give caliphs elephants as gifts. We know, for example, that Harun al-Rashid's son, al-Mutasim, had one in 838, who had arrived in Baghdad that way, although we don't know when the gift was made. Harun himself is reported as having received gifts from Indian kings, as did his father, al-Mahdi, before him, and it's possible that Abul Abbas was, up, was among those gifts. So there were three great powers in India at that time, the Gujara Pratiharas in, in the northwest, the Rashtrakutas in the south, based in, in the Deccan, and the Pala Empire in the, in the east, based in Bengal here. And all three powers uh, competed, you know, competed, particularly in the upper Ganges region, which is where, which had been the heartland of, pre, of previous empires. If Abul Abbas was a gift, they were the most likely sources. Of the three, we can probably rule out the Gujara Pratiharas here. They had the fewest elephants, 
because their geography was least favorable to them, as they had relatively few forests. More importantly, because they bordered, they bordered the Abbasid province of Sindh, which you can see here, yeah, yeah, they, you know, they, were, they were the ones who were most often at war with the caliphates and generally most hostile. It therefore seems unlikely that they would have given the caliphate an elephant. The other two are more likely. The Caliph al Mahmun, another son of Harun, who ruled 813 to 833, is known to have received envoys and gifts from the ruler of the Pala Empire. And this may well have included that elephant that his brother and heir, al Mutassim, possessed that I mentioned earlier. The dates of the Pala rulers are still hard to pin down, but it is possible that the ruler in al Mahmun's early reign was Dharma Pala, who had ruled from the 780s. If so, the same emperor may have been inclined to give different caliphs elephants. Alternative, alternatively, the Rashtrakutas might also have supplied Abu Abbas. In the ninth century, they had a reputation for being the friendliest to Muslims and the caliphates, and also for having the most elephants. Alternatively, Abu Abbas might have been boosy from warfare. Traditionally, caliphs disposed of elephants captured on campaign. al baladri writes that after the conquest of Ctesiphon, the victorious Muslims wrote to Caliph Umar I, asking what to do with the elephants they had captured. Tabari has a similar account of the taking of Makran in Balochistan in 644, when the commanding general wrote to the caliph asking instruction concerning the elephants he had captured. It therefore seems entirely possible that Harun or his predecessors might have acquired Abu Abbas through warfare. The problem is that we can't narrow the context down very much. There isn't much evidence for major warfare between the Abbasids and the Gujara Pratiharas after the 770s, but low-scale raiding seems to have continued on and off throughout the period. So far, you might reasonably say that I've just given you a lot of conjecture, but my point is that elephants were hard to get, even for a man with the power and resources of Harun al-Rashid's. While scholars have generally scoffed at Einhard's assertion that Harun al-Rashid sent Charlemagne the only elephant that he had, it is true that the caliphs do not seem to have had many elephants at their disposal. Harun's son, al-Mutasim, as we said, seems to possess one elephant. In 917 or 918, Byzantine ambassadors are, uh, you know, like, uh, arrived in Baghdad were shown a display of 100 lions, two giraffes, and four elephants. There's an additional bit of context here, which, which perhaps seems relevant. At the time that Charlemagne's envoys would have reached Harun's courts, the caliph's access to any resources in India would have been particularly fragile. The Abbasid province of Sindh, which was the, ca the caliphate's window into India for military, diplomatic, or commercial purposes, was in the midst of a civil war. Sindh had been settled by different Arab kin groups following the conquests, and their descendants were extremely powerful in, uh, in the province. We don't know exactly when, but at some point in the middle of the 790s, fighting broke out between the Yemeni faction and the Nizariya. We don't have exact dates for any of this, but, the, uh, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but we know that Harun al-Rashid sent a series of governors to restore order, and they failed and were defeated in battle by local armies. The Nizariya got the upper hand and attempted to parcel out Sindh among their supporters. This must have taken some time. Our first fixed point is the year 800, when a newly appointed governor, Dawood bin Yazid bin Hatim al muhaladi succeeded in crushing the Nizariya, which he did with the utmost brutality. It took several months, and the capture and sack of all the cities of Sindh, including the capital of al-Mansura. This has implications for Harun al-Rashid sending an elephant to Charlemagne. Not only were the elephants rare, but at the specific time that the Carolingian envoys arrived in 797 or 798, it was a very real question whether Harun would ever have control over Sindh and therefore easy access to India. This means that the Caliph was passing with a very scarce resource indeed, one he might potentially never get access to again. So what does all of this mean? There is a school of thought that says diplomacy was a much bigger deal for Charlemagne than it was for Harun al-Rashid, but the former was a distant barbarian who was thrilled that the Caliph an immensely wealthy and powerful monarch should even deign to send him some trifles. 
I think the rarity of an elephant meant that Abul Abbas wasn't a small present for Harun al-Rashid to use to awe and pacify a distant savage. The, uh, you know, like, you know, like you know, there, there was an importance to this interaction that mattered for the Caliph, enough to make sending a stupendous present worth his while. Harun followed this up by sending in 807 a tent and curtains made of different colors and of wonderful size and beauty. They were all the best linen, the curtains as well as the strings, and dyed in different colors. The presence of the king consisted besides of many precious silken robes, of perfumes, ointments, and balsam, also a brass clock, a marvelous mechanical device. As you can see by this list of gifts reported by the Frankish annals, the Caliph was investing in this relationship with Charlemagne. I believe that Harun's interest in the Carolingians had less to do with the Franks per se and more to do with domestic concerns. Harun's position as Caliph wasn't secure. He had come to power in a coup against his nephew in 786. He was not popular in Baghdad or with the standing army and was very dependent upon the Barmakid family to run the civil administration. Rebellions in core provinces such as Iraq were an endemic problem. What happened in Sindh was also happening in North Africa at the same time, where a series of governors were unable to manage the province. In 800, just as Dawud bin Yazid was subduing Sindh, Harun al-Rashid recognized Ibrahim bin al-Aglab as the ruler of North Africa. Ibn al-Aglab did homage to the caliph, but he was effectively independent and his successors would rule the area for more than a century. In addition to these challenges, the, the end of the 790s saw Harun plan a, a number of ambitious changes in his court. This came to a head in December 802, when he went on pilgrimage to Mecca. There, he published a plan for, his, for the succession in which one of his sons, Al-Amin, would be his heir and would in turn be succeeded by another of his sons, Al-Mahmun. In addition, al Mahmun was to be the governor of the important province of Khurasan, the heartlands of Abbasid military power. The two, swore, the two sons swore to uphold this in the Kaaba. The following month, Harun al-Rashid destroyed the Barmakid family, who had previously been his chief advisors, and dominated important posts within the caliphates. This means that in the very years that he was in diplomatic contact with the Franks, Harun al-Rashid needed to bolster his legitimacy. Interestingly, Chinese sources uh, mentioned that the Caliph sent an unusually grand embassy to the Tang Dynasty in 798, with no clear purpose attached to it. Our only Arabic evidence for awareness of Harun al-Rashid's dealings with Charlemagne are couched in terms of the Franks coming to the Caliph bearing gifts. I think that sending and receiving high-profile embassies from Charlemagne was intended to strengthen Harun's image as a mighty and important ruler and that by the giving of immensely valuable presence, you know, like was, was part of this, by cementing his authority through a demonstration of wealth and confidence. The Book of Gifts and Rarities states that Harun al-Rashid's son, al-Mahmun, competed with both the Indian kings and the Byzantine emperor in gift-giving. When he received presents from Constantinople, the caliph is supposed to have said, send him a gift a hundred times greater than his so that he realizes the glory of Islam and the grace of Allah bestowed on us through it. Whether or not this actually happened you know, is unclear and probably unimportant. What I suggest matters is that this gives us a sense of how caliphs were expected to behave by giving generous gifts and as a means of demonstrating their power and authority. And India was very much a part of this. In the medieval Islamic imagination, India was a land of wonders. Stories grew about the animals of India, with the elephant as one of the most important. It was also a land of knowledge and wisdom, associated with medicine, philosophy, and astrology. Indian fables and wisdom literature, filtered through Persian translators, such as the Khalil Wadimna, were very popular in the Abbasid courts. And we know that Harun al-Rashid sponsored some of these translations. This Indian tradition shaped how elephants were viewed and interpreted, and, and the elephant became the emblematic animal of India, associated with the subcontinents in every way. Elephants also mattered 
because the Abbasid rulers modeled their regimes on the precedents of Sasanian Persia. Elephants featured on the monumental relics of the pre-Islamic royal past, including the enormous rock relief raised by Khosrow II at the Taki Bustan, showing the Shah and Shah hunting boar with the aid of elephants. Al-Masudi wrote that Khosrow had a thousand elephants whiter than the snow, some of them 12 cubits high, which is very rare among elephants of war, for their tallest size varies between nine and 10 cubits. He adds that Khosrow preferred them to all other animals on account of their intelligence and their training. Caliph al-Mansur, Harun's grandfather, is described as having possessed elephants because the old kings made much of them, buying them, taking them to war, and making an ornament of them in their ceremonies. These Persian kings were celebrated for their dealings with India. Al-Masudi says of Khosrow that the kings of India, Sindh, and all the countries of the north and the south concluded peace with the king of Persia. From everywhere, he received presents and deputations for fear of, an, of, of his impetuosity, the strength of his army, and the extent of his empire. The Book of Gifts and Rarities also notes that Khosrow received from the king of India fabulous presents. And, and these, these presents are mostly fantastical, but I think it speaks of the wonder and wealth that, they were that was associated with India in this period and how impressive dealing with, uh, with them was. The Abbasids aimed to emulate this. Al-Yakubi says of Harun's father, Al-Mahdi, that he received submission and tribute from the kings of India like the kings of Persia of old. In being able to give away an elephant, a walking symbol of India, a distant land that was synonymous with magic, Harun al-Rashid was demonstrating his power and wealth while showing himself to be the true heir to the kings of Persia. At a moment when he needed to assert and demonstrate his authority and his legitimacy more than ever, that was valuable. There could also be few more potent demonstrations of universal kingship and the capacity to send an animal from the farthest east all the way to the farthest west of the continents. The particular context of the civil war and sins adds extra meaning. Elephants don't move all that quickly. Given that Abul Abbas and company arrived in North Africa early in 801, the balance of probability is that Harun al-Rashid sent him before Sindh was back under his control. His doing so might then be interpreted as a statement of confidence in his ability to reconquer Sindh because he was willing to give away an elephant he might not be able to replace. And the less likely possibility that Harun sent Abul Abbas after the rebels had been crushed, you know, he might well have been a symbol of victory, possibly captured in battle and Sindh itself. In this way, the Caliph communicated to the wider world. It may, it may also be significant that Abul Abbas traveled through North Africa. As I mentioned earlier, the year before the elephant arrived in North Africa, Harun al-Rashid had recognized Ibrahim bin al-Aglab as the ruler of the region. Ibn al-Aglab and his descendants were effectively independents, but Harun did not necessarily see this as a permanent state of affairs. Sending an elephant to Charlemagne through Ibrahim's lands would have been a potent reminder to him of Harun's power and resources, and the generosity he was capable of, capable of to those who worked with him. In this way, Harun could use his gift of an elephant to communicate to multiple audiences. So in this section, I've tried to explain why I think it's important that we keep Abul Abbas's Indian origin in mind when we talk about Harun al-Rashid's diplomacy with Charlemagne. The Caliph was giving away a scarce resource that was imbued with meaning. This was an important decision that he was making in doing so. His capacity to dispose of such a creature was a statement of his confidence and wealth at a moment of uncertainty. So in the final section of my talk, I want to discuss the Frankish end of this arrangements. I intend to argue that Charlemagne and his court were well aware that Abul Abbas came from India and that this was an important part of how they responded to him. Charlemagne sent his first embassy to Harun al-Rashid at an interesting time. The acquisition of impressive gifts from Harun was part of a wider practice in the second half of Charlemagne's reign. 
the Frankish annals in this period place great emphasis on the arrival of diplomats from abroad. As Charlemagne stayed longer in Aachen and led fewer campaigns in person, so the world increasingly was portrayed as coming to him. Recent scholarship has written about a change in Charlemagne's reign from around 790, with a shift toward active governance. And this manifested itself in a new range of more ambitious legislation and a sequence of church synods, but also in a new range of written activity connected to the court. The Frankish realm was increasingly portrayed as a universal Christian empire in the 790s in this output. It has sometimes been suggested that Charlemagne's embassy to Harun was part of a build-up towards his imperial coronation in 800s. Instead, I think it seems more helpful to think of both of them as products of this grander post-790 conception of Charlemagne's role in the reform and government of the peoples of his empire. This was a bold vision, which required the participation and support of elites throughout Charlemagne's domains. By reaching out to the caliphates, and in particular, by acquiring an elephant, the king could make this uh, moment of transformation tangible, a demonstration that something important was happening that would elevate those who participated in this shared project of empire. That Abul Abbas was Indian would have added you know, to this impact. None of the Frankish sources explicitly say that Abul Abbas was Indian. However, there are a number of hints that Charlemagne and his court were, were aware of this. For a start, there were all sorts of people who could have told Charlemagne that where his elephant was from. The diplomats that Harun al-Rashid sent would probably have known it, and it would have been a natural thing to bring up in conversation. Isaac the Jew would probably also have known that, that uh, and yeah, been aware of, of Abu Abbas's origin. We should probably also imagine that Abu Abbas arrived with handlers who might well have been Indian themselves. If the authority of human speech was not enough, the Carol engineer had access to multiple texts as well that would have suggested India to them. In his etymologies, written in the seventh century and widely distributed as authoritative in the early medieval worlds, Isidore of Seville stated that previously elephants were only born in Africa and, and India. Now, India alone produces them. The anonymous 8th century writer of the cosmography of Ethicus Ista placed elephants among a range of other fantastic animals, writing that India generates huge birds and parrots that speak like humans. It has elephants and unicorns. An interesting clue is to be found in the geography produced by the Irish monk Nicuil. This work is largely dependent on classical writers, particularly Julius Solinus, but Dickie will occasionally insert his own observations. One of these moments comes when he makes reference to Charlemagne's elephants. Solinus had asserted that elephants could not bend their knees, something that Dickie knew was untrue because he had talked to people who had seen a bulabas. His work was organized geographically, and because Dickie knew that elephants could be found in both India and Africa, he included them in both sections. But he talks about Charlemagne's elephants in the section on India, suggesting that, that he knew that this was specifically where Abulabas was from. If, as I've argued, Charlemagne and his court were, were aware that Abulabas was an, an Indian elephant, that has a number of important implications. As in the Caliphates, India was perceived both as a land of magic and of wealth. The poet Theodolf of Orléans wrote of gem-rich India, filled with spices and ivory objects. Others, such as Ermold the Black and Robanus Maurus, inspired by their readings of Virgil, describe India as a land of saffron and ivory. Being able to bring and possess a fabulous creature all the way from India would have been inherently impressive. The involvement of India also cast a specific light on Charlemagne's dealings with Harun al-Rashid. So as mentioned earlier, our most detailed discussion of these relations comes from Einhard's biography of Charlemagne. Einhard wrote that Charlemagne had such friendly and harmonious relations with Harun, the king of the Persians, who held virtually the whole East except for India, that Harun preferred his goodwill to that of all the other kings and princes in the world, and judged him alone to be worthy 
uh, worth cultivating by respect and generosity. So as we can see here, the point that Einhard is making is that one of the signs of Charlemagne's stature is that other rulers recognize his greatness. Einhard slowly builds up to this point, beginning with Charlemagne's relations with Alfonso II of Asturias, then with the submission of Irish kings, before describing his friendship with Haroun. Unlike Alfonso and the Irish kings, who submit themselves as servants and subjects, or on the emperors of Byzantium, who are discussed after Haroun and acknowledge Charlemagne's status grudgingly, the caliph is described as an admirer of Charlemagne from afar. Haroun's respect manifested in precious gifts, among which were robes, perfumes, and rich treasures from Eastern lands. A few years earlier, Haroun had sent him the only elephant he then possessed, simply because the king asked for it. So part of the point that Einhard is making here was that Haroun's reverence stretched to making a personal sacrifice by sending Charlemagne his only elephant, a sacrifice that did nothing to turn the caliph against him. As, as we just saw, Einhard was aware that Haroun did not rule India, calling it the one bit of the East that Haroun did, did not rule. Einhard was in a position to know that the Bulabas was from India. It therefore added to his argument for how much the caliph esteemed Charlemagne to be able to say that Haroun al-Rashid had given him a gift that came from outside of his own, of his own domains. Einhard offers a clue here for how Charlemagne may have depicted his new presence uh, you know, uh, to his court and subjects as the ultimate embodiment of the respect for, with which the Frankish ruler was held. This glamour and grandeur mattered. And, the, uh, you know, and, and we can see that decades later, people like Notka the Stammer in the 880s were still illustrating the power and majesty of Charlemagne by telling of how Haroun understood from small things the superior power of Charlemagne. Abul Abbas as an Indian elephant would only have added to that impression. I, I do apologize, my, um, I, forgot to, uh, I forgot to silence my phone. It's now, it's, you know, it's, it's now going slightly mad. So much as Harun al-Rashid modeled himself on the Persian kings of old, so too did, uh, did Charlemagne with the heroes of the Greco-Roman Greco classical past. The reign of Charlemagne saw the continuation of the so-called Carolingian Renaissance, when huge numbers of classical texts were copied and used by intellectuals connected to Charlemagne. Alexander the Great was a subject of much interest, and letters purporting to have been sent by the Macedonian conqueror to Aristotle from India, describing the subcontinents, circulated um, you know, the Carolingian worlds. At some point between 800 and 804, Alcuin of York sent Charlemagne a, a, you know, a collection of letters supposedly be between, from between Alexander the Great and Dindamus, king of the Brahmins of India. Although the text is actually a fifth century composition, Alcuin and Charlemagne could have seen in the correspondence a parallel to the emperor's own communication with a mighty Eastern monarch, given that these were the very years Charlemagne was in conversation with Harun al-Rashid. That Abul Abbas was from India would only have strengthened the implied comparison. Alexander was not the only example here. Einhard drew upon Suetonius's life of Augustus and his depiction of Charlemagne. In that life, Suetonius wrote, the reputation for prowess and moderation, which he, Augustus, thus gained, uh, led even the Indians and the Scythians, nations known to us only by hearsay, to send envoys of their own free will and sue for his friendship and that of the Roman people. A similar line appears in one of the most important sources for Carolingian history writers, Erosius' Seven Books of History Against the Pagans. Legates of the Indians and, and the Scythians, after crossing over the whole world, finally came, came uh, upon Caesar, that's Augustus, at Taraco, a city of hither Spain, beyond which they could not have sought him, and poured out upon him the story of the glory of Alexander the Great. In Spain and the farthest west, eastern India and northern Scythia besought him suppliantly with tribute from their own countries. So we can see a lot of ideas here. Augustus as the heir to Alexander, Augustus uniting the whole world behind his reputation, Augustus as someone who people want to, be, want to bring presents from India to. And this quote is preserved in many of the histories from the time of Charlemagne. 
This same incident of Augustus receiving envoys from India while he was in Spain was reported by Florus in the second century. But with a significant difference for us, according to Florus, the Indians who live immediately beneath the sun brought elephants among their gifts as well as precious stones and pearls. The transmission of Florus is less clear than that of Suetonius and Erosius. We know there was a copy of his history at the Abbey of Lorsch in the early ninth century, which was an important center with close ties to court. It seems, it seems possible that someone close to Charlemagne may have been aware of this precedence, but it's not certain. Augustus was an example for Charlemagne, and not just because Einhard used his life as a model for his own biography. Charlemagne's coronation as emperor in 800 is, of course, one of the clearest examples of the influence of the Roman past. Poets proclaim Charlemagne to be the new Augustus. Paintings of Augustus gaze down upon the revelers in the Carolingian palace at Ingelheim. It would have been known that Augustus had received envoys from India bearing gifts. It might also have been known that these Indians had brought Augustus elephants. As the recently crowned Emperor Charlemagne attempted to assert his authority and status, Abu Labas would have been immensely useful. That he was from India would have added to the comparison with Augustus. Abu Labas coming from India would, would have been highly relevant information for Charlemagne. It would have connected him to a poorly understood land associated with Wanda. It would have demonstrated just how special his relationship with Harun al Rashid was, and it would have strengthened comparisons with Charlemagne. And, you know, and, and the greater conquerors and emperors of the classical past, particularly Alexander and Augustus. So you, you may well be grateful to hear that I'm, I'm about to, uh, to conclude. So to wrap up, Abu Labas was an Asian elephant, originally from India. He was a rare and precious animal, even at the court of Harun al-Rashid, and giving him away was a statement of wealth and confidence at a time when the Caliph's ability to intervene in India was much in doubt. The Carolingians were aware of much of this and had added to the value and significance of Abu Labas when he arrived at Aachen in 802. I'm sure that everyone here is familiar with the fable of the blind men and the elephants. One of the lessons of that ancient Indian tale is that to understand how a person perceives an object, or in this case an elephant, we must first understand where they are and how they learn about the world. I would like to imagine that whether or not Charlemagne's elephant was an African or an Asian elephant is an interesting enough question on its own merits. But I hope that what I've also demonstrated today is why it had ramifications beyond that. Abu Labas being from India had logistical implications, but it also changes how we understand what Charlemagne and Harun al-Rashid were up to when they reached out to each other. Although they approached Abu Labas from different perspectives, there was nonetheless a great deal of shared meaning for the pair of rulers. For both of them, India was a distant and exotic land, synonymous with wealth and wonder. For both of them, India was redolent of the great kings of the past who they aspired to imitate. And for both of them, the, the trouble taken to, sec to secure and transport an elephant originally from India attested to the seriousness with which they took their relationship with each other. Ultimately, the thought I want to finish with today is the importance of understanding cultural diplomacy in the past and the deep significance of even apparently trivial details, such as where, where Charlemagne's elephant came from. Thank you so much for listening. I, I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much for this fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, now we have time for questions, remarks, from uh, the audience. Um, so I will dare to ask uh, first question uh, before discussing uh, the um, issue of the elephant. Uh, let's turn a little bit to the um, to Charlemagne's uh, implications in the Holy Land and his uh, his uh, uh, rules actually uh, in Palestine and 
that uh, paved uh, in one or another way uh, the pilgrimage to Jerusalem in the West, Western pilgrimage to Jerusalem in, uh, in the eighth century. Oh, uh, well, I mean, that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, an excellent question. I think so Charlemagne was very, very interested in, uh, in pilgrimage, but I think, I think to a certain extent, the, um, the pilgrimage actually comes, comes before. And uh, one of the things that's very interesting is that we see, um, so Charlemagne's first embassy, they actually, uh, in order to get to Harun al-Rashid, they travel with the pilgrimage ship. So we know, we know they, they took a boat out from, from Venice with, you know, with, uh, with some monks who were traveling uh, who were traveling to to Jerusalem, and they they stopped off in Jerusalem before before going to um uh, you know, before going to to uh, Harun al Rashid. So there's a yeah. You know, so they're so to a certain extent they're following they're following the, these routes along. But you know, but you're right. And the um so in the um so in in the second embassy that's uh, that Charlemagne sends, which is the one he sends in um in 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 eight oh two, it looks like um it looks like he he came to an arrangement with Harun al Rashid that's a uh, he will be allowed to sponsor buildings and new churches in Jerusalem, and that's that's a big deal because um, Christians are not normally allowed to repair churches in in the Caliphate. So you know this is this is quite significant. And he so Charlemagne is allowed to to put buildings up to you know to restore things and you know set up hostels as well where where um, where where pilgrims can stay. And you know, and, there, and there's some fascinating material. So we we have a wonderful study that um, that Charlemagne had commissioned of. Of all the kind of of, of the church in Palestine as it stood, so he so he knew where best to, to spend his money. So you know how, you know how, how best sort of help them out. Um, it's calling it rule of Palestine is is probably a bit is is it you know is you know it like is you know it's, it's perhaps not you know not not quite right. He's you know it's it's more it's more a case of it's it's more a case of of uh, of influence. But it's mm -hmm. and it's a thing that then matters. You know so so uh, so the patriarchs of Jerusalem start sending him him messengers and. And right for the rest of the century, we can see Charlemagne and, and his descendants regularly sending money to, you know, to the churches in Jerusalem in order, in order, to, in order to pay for their upkeep. So it is, you know, it's a very important connection for them. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for this remark. Actually, I, I, uh, I would like to clarify why I started uh, with this question and not with with a question related to uh, to the the main point of your talk, uh, because uh, actually I, I consider very important to clarify if this uh, uh, question that uh, Charlemagne addressed to Harun al-Rashid uh, to send him an elephant uh, happened before, uh, before the period uh, in which we know that um, the royal annals mentioned that the patriarch of Jerusalem has sent to Charlemagne the keys of the city and of the mountain. So this happened. This uh, this happened before that period or after that? Because uh, it seems to me that uh, Charlemagne uh, is looking to establish his power as emperor, as an a uh, new uh, uh, Constantine as, uh, as a new uh, Augustine, um, and he tried he tried to uh, uh, to get influence uh, on one side in Palestine on on the Christian holy sites and on the other sides uh, eastward uh, uh, to the magical land india and uh, this it seems to me to to uh, have two different horizons that support his policy as universal emperor oh i i think i think i think you're you're absolutely right in the end and charlemagne is is a roman emperor but he is also a christian emperor as you're as you're you're, you're very right to observe but I, so I, I think that the elephant comes first, and then the patriarch. And, and, okay. and yeah, and the re the reason I think this is, um, is we can, um, we, we know we know that um, his first embassy, the one that asks the elephant, they they stop off in in um, in they stop off in in um, in, uh, in in Palestine. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. You know, and they, 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 you know, they, they, yeah, and, and then they, and then they go off, and then the patriarch, the patriarch meets them, and then it, it comes into his head to to send to send an embassy. And the interesting thing is, we, it's the patriarch who decides to, to who decides to talk to um to Charlemagne, not not the other way around. And then, I mean, once once the patriarch gets in touch with Charlemagne, Charlemagne immediately says, ah. This is, you know, like, you know, this can work. You know, we kind of, we, we both, you know, we can, we can, we can work with each other. Right? You know, sort of, you know, the, you know, the patriarch will kind of, you know, will, you know, kind of will, will help me be, be the new Constantine, as you say. And I, I will help the patriarch by sort of, you know, by, by helping kind of, you know, you know, fix, you know, you know, uh, fix the churches. And I, I think, you know, they can, you know, as you say, they come to a, you know, an excellent, you know, an excellent partnership. But I, I think, I think it's the patriarch realizes that's, that Charlemagne is is interested in 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 you know in Harun al Rashid and sees and sees an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very clear. Thank you so much. No, no, no. Um, I think we have some questions in chat uh, from Maxim Onofre. If I may, beyond seeking to quell internal dissent and force our external treats through opulent and positive dip diplomatic overtures. To all neighboring powers, not only the Carolingians, what, if any, geopolitical consideration would Harun al Rashid have given to the momentous rise of the new Frankish Empire? In two, the Battle of Tours was still within living memory. I apologize for only being to join you through text, but my current surroundings aren't at all conducive to. Holding audio recording. So this is the first question. No, thank you. I think I think that's you know I think that that's a really excellent question, uh, Maxim. And I and you know and, and thank you so much for um for uh, for asking it. So so I so I think I think I think there's a couple of ways we can we can think about we can think about this. Um. So in practical terms, in many ways, the, the Franks are actually you know, are actually quite far away from you know from um from Areas that Harun al Rashid really cares about. We like you. Know, he, you know, he, you know, like in his time, the, the you know, the in, in his time, you know, the Abbasids, you know, don't, you know, don't really control Spain, and they all, yeah, and 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 as we see by about eight hundred, he no longer really controls North Africa either. So, so to a certain extent, there's there is there is a bit of a of of a, of a geographical gap here. Nonetheless, like you know, the as you know, the seven nineties and the eight hundreds, we see Charlemagne being. Increasingly active across the across the Mediterranean, we can we can see here he gets involved in North African politics in the 790s, and he yeah and and the Byzantines get very worried that he's about to invade Sicily. So there is I think I think Harun al Rashid is definitely aware that Charlemagne is is the ruler of an empire that's getting much more aggressive. Uh, but one thing one of the sources I find very interesting is there's there's quite a lot of uh, Arabic apocalyptic material that circulates at this time. So this is this is kind of stuff about Predictions about the end of the world, predictions about sort of, you know, kind of, you know, like, you know, what, you know, the, you know, the second coming of Jesus and, you know, and, you know, and interestingly, and, you know, and these, these are, these are, you know, Muslim apocalypses and interesting, the Franks feature in this as a very dangerous and very powerful enemy. They're kind of often, they're often agents of the apocalypse, right? You know, there's, there's, there's fascinating stories about a king of the Franks who is going to invade Spain, march through North Africa, and you and fight a great battle against against pious Muslims in Egypt. So I, I think, I think, I think there is, a, I think there is an idea in the Caliphate that the Franks are a powerful, aggressive, and you know, and, and potentially dangerous opponent, yeah, opponents. And I think, I think this, I think while I suspect that Harun is probably not directly worried about about Charlemagne. I think that reputation for ferocity is useful. I think I think it, I think it makes it all the more impressive when Harun al Rashid can say, "Look at these, you know, look at these Franks coming, bringing me gifts, standing in my court, like you know, these ferocious, you know, like agents of the apocalypse from from beyond the far west. They they think they respect me. They they think I'm great." Yeah, but you're yeah, you know, you're very you're you're very right that it is very very hard to work out geopolitical questions on the basis of of the sources we have, and you know, and kind of one of the issues are, are that you know, kind of a lot of our sources are very are very brief. They're often very short. They're not yeah. You know, we don't have we don't have a lot of the letters, a lot of the diaries, which you know, modern geopolitics is 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 written based on. So we we have to sort of we have to infer on the basis of sort of what's you know what, what you know of what we know the rulers do, and we and we have to try to think about 
what else is going on at, at you know at that time and how how it all fits in with with the wider context. Um, but you know, it is it is it is very much a challenge, and I think I you know and I, I think it, it was it's an it's an excellent question to ask, yeah, and I hope that helps. Um, let's turn to the second question coming from uh, Maximo Nofre. I was just wondering whether we can indeed infer such geopolitical realities from historical sources, which, as you have shown, always had their own agendas to pursue. So it's a question of the character of sources. Yep. No, absolutely. I think uh, the um, it's yeah, you know, and and it's it's you know it's it's profoundly difficult sort of to work out kind of because there are there are very few places where we have a source where someone sits down and says this is why i decided to do a thing or this is this is why you should you should you know you should you know, like you you know, like you should do a thing and i i don't think that's i don't think that's because they necessarily never had those conversations it's just it's quite sensitive it's you know it's a sort of thing you might keep secrets and it's and it's and also it's a sort of thing that might not circulate in many in many copies and if you think about the number of really important texts we have that only survive in one manuscript like you know, it's it's very easy. You can see how something like a memorandum like 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 that might might get lost. So so you're 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 absolutely right about kind of that the the you know, the sources for thinking about about geopolitics in this way are are, are always very are always very challenging. And I I you know I I yes yeah, so like I think I I kind of I my you know, my like you know my approach is always is you know is is as, as I mentioned earlier, try to try to place the you know try to place you know to really think about what you know what you know what you know what monarchs are doing what what else is going on is going on, is going on in their mind and 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 you know and, and to, in a way to try to read the sources a lot a little bit against against the grain sometimes so to think about kind of what are the things that might be a little bit embarrassing what are what you know what what are you know what are, are the are are the other things that are that are are, are going on but yes um excellent question thank you so much for this answer. Uh, there is another one from Andre Oprea. You mentioned that the route to transport the elephant uh, via North Africa was chosen on purpose as a political message uh, towards the Aglabids. My question is, was there any other route to Western Europe readily available by which such a massive and difficult cargo could be taken safely? No, that's you know that that is that that is an uh, an excellent question. I think and you know, and I, I think you know I think you know like it, you know like you know it's it's entirely reasonable to say that actually you know the you know the, there's no you know there isn't there isn't anything anything particularly political about this. It's you know elephants are hard to transport, right? And that you you might want to try to minimize the amounts you know the amount you know um the, uh, the amount of distance you have to get a quite nervous and quite scared elephant on on, on a boat across you know across the Mediterranean. Yeah, I mean that. That said, like so, um, so we know, for example, that the next, um, so the next embassy, the next that, uh, um, which which doesn't bring live cargo, but does bring an enormous uh, musical organ, um, sort of sets and you know, um, sets up and and, and and you know lands in Italy and doesn't seem to go via Africa, but instead seems seem seems to come from from Egypt. So theoretically, you could you could move something large, but I but I agree that an elephant is probably. A, a bit more difficult, even even then, even than a large, you know, the uh, even a large organ. But one of the things I find quite interesting about about all of this is that the um, is that you know the boat the boat used to transport it is um, is a Frankish boat. So the um, so what what happens is that the uh, um, you know the en the envoys arrive in Italy and they say they say to Charlemagne, so we brought your elephants. Um, it's in Africa. Um, you know you need to pick it up. And the and there's you know like you know so you know so. So, you know, so you know, so what? Yeah, you know, like, so what else might be happening here is that they're making transporting the elephant Charlemagne's problem rather than ra ra rather than than you know than than, than their problem. So yes, yeah, so, and all of those are, are very reasonable objections. But I, I do think that there is there is a, there are, you know that it's quite striking that this is happening a year after because you know, uh, you know, throughout the 790s, North Africa has been politically unstable. Um, Harun Al Rashid has sent lots of governors. Trying to control it, they've mostly failed, and as a result of that failure, he's more or less had to agree to legitimise you know, a local warlord who has has succeeded in taking it into you know into in taking over the province. And I, I find it I find it quite interesting that sort of that 
literally a year a year after that arrangement is made, Harun Al Rashid chooses to send an elephant right right through that that territory. And I sort of and what you know, so while the practical logistics might be the most important thing happening happening here, I I yeah I I, yeah, I do wonder if there's at least a secondary effect of sending this incredibly impressive animal straight through kind of this this territory as as a reminder of you know, of 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 your power and and you know and and, and influence yeah and and, and you know and, and to a certain extent that's that's a relationship that the aglobids are kind of kind of lean into right they they sort of you know they they you know they they, they make a quite a big deal about their relationship with the abbasids they when they set up a new capital they call it like you know the, you know, the as you know the the abbasid place so i think i think i think you know i think for, to a certain extent ibrahim might not have been unhappy with the idea of kind of being associated with this with this animal as well as as well as taking the points of of Abbasid's um, wealth and power. Mm -hmm. so, thank you so much for this uh, answer. Uh, I would like to address a, uh, a last question from my side. Um, again uh, focused on Jerusalem and uh, of Palestine and my question is how important was Charlemagne's support for the sea of Jerusalem to balance somehow his role in in within the Christianity in 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 the de in the de detriment to to Byzantium and to the uh, to the sea of Constantinople Oh, that that is that is an you know an an excellent question. So uh, so I think so so uh, the first thing to note is that the um you know Byzantium or you know, the Byzantines are you know were, were clearly aware of what of what Charlemagne was doing. There's um you know one one of one of our best sources for that for his activity is is the De Administrando of Constantine the Seventh Porphyrogenitus Porfiri Porfiri in the in the tenth century where he he mentions you know and you know he mentions Charlemagne's activity and he. Interestingly, he mentions it in you know, he mentions it praising. You know, he says, you know, this is this is a good thing that Char that that, Char uh, that Charlemagne did. Um, but I think I think I think you're I think you're you're quite right to see an element of rivalry or you know like you know you know, you know, you know and it's it's interesting that, that there really doesn't seem to be much Byzantine activity in you know in in this you know in in, in this place. I think it's it's quite striking that we have we have references to figures from. You know, who travel? You know, who travel from Jerusalem, and they initially go to Constantinople, and then find themselves in in the Frankish world because that's that's where that's where the money is. That's where you know that's you know that's that's where it's easiest for them to kind of you know to find you know to you know, uh, to find support and find and you know, and find so I so I you know, I I I I I absolutely agree. there is there is an element here of of you know of of, of rivalry and that and that's and that's pay, and that patronizing Jerusalem. Really, you know, really, really, really matters for that. Um, I mean, of, of course, you know, and as and as as you know, as as I'm sure you, you know, like you know, you you, you want to leave out. I think I think there is also an element of Charlemagne is genuinely pious and you know, and genuinely wants wants to support the patriarch of Jerusalem. But I, you know, it's but it's very much part of that. Um, and um, so Einhard has you know, has a famous passage where he talks about Charlemagne's generosity to the people, you know, kind of to Christians. Beyond, beyond, yeah, yeah, you know, kind of, you know, and elsewhere. So he talks about, you know, he, so it's not just, it's, you know, it's, it's not just Jerusalem. He's sending money to North Africa. He's sending, you know, uh, you know he, he, he's sending, you know, he's uh, like, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's probably saying, you know, he's sending money to Spain. There's, there's a very interesting set of letters to Christians in Spain where he sort of, you know, he kind of, he says, you know, I've, I've been trying to free you, and you know, and you, and instead you run around going being heretics, right? There's a, and I, and I, and I think it's very interesting that. The, that when Charlemagne dies, among the people gathered around him, as, he, as he's as he's finally are uh, um, are monks from Syria, right? He has he has them gathered around him. They're helping him, kind of when he's yeah you know, with with his work. So like so, I think I think this is all really really huge part of his his fashioning of himself as, as an emperor and as and, and as a ruler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, a very short remark to to uh, your section. What did India mean for Harun al Rashid and for Baghdad? Uh, we know that uh, already from the Umayyad time, from the seventh century, 
the East Syriac Patriarch from Seleucia Ctesiphon uh, had very good contacts to, to India and uh, Ishweab the third. Uh, then uh, Timoteus the first who changed the, uh, the seat from um, uh, Seleucia Ctesiphon to uh, Baghdad um, had also uh, established different parishes in Malabar in India and uh, uh, also uh, metropolitan for that country. So the contacts were, uh, uh, were very close between Baghdad and uh, the Indians also in terms of Christianity at that time. And we know also um, from different, different traders, uh, from contacts between traders because as you mentioned very well, uh, India was filled with uh, different uh, spices and precious, precious things, perfumes and, and so on. Uh, maybe it was not very difficult for Harun al-Rashid to uh, maintain contacts to India because this was a, a we, we, we are talking about uh, previous tradition bef uh, between, uh, of contacts between those two areas, uh, on one side Mesopotamia and on the other side uh, India. Oh, if, quite, you know, quite possibly, I, I, shall, I, I, shall, I shall need to think about that. Yeah. Uh, and we have, uh, maybe you, you can use in your research also, uh, Synodicon uh, uh, Orientale. This is the collection of the East Syriac uh, church from uh, Mesopotamia with all the uh, local synods and um, uh, different uh, uh, texts, different uh, canons uh, uh, established on, on that uh, councils. Uh, we have, for example, in sixth century, uh, a letter uh, uh, between uh, Jacob uh, of Dirin uh, from the uh, Arabian Gulf, from the Persian Gulf, and uh, Ishweab the first. He was patriarch, East Syriac patriarch, uh, at the beginning of the sixth century. And they uh, spoke on different questions, on different issues uh, uh, in terms of uh, liturgy, but also on everyday uh, questions uh, um, from that uh, region, from, from the south uh, part of uh, Mesopotamia. And maybe this will uh, guide you better uh, towards India. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, then yeah, that sounds yeah, that sounds really interesting. I shall I shall definitely have to look into it. Yeah, thank you so much from my side and from uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Levant Culture and Civilization. This was a wonderful um, presentation. Uh, we keep in touch and we hope for uh, different uh, cooperations in future with you. And yeah, thank you so much for the for the invitation, and thank you, and thank you so much for for your for your, for your questions. I yeah, I've uh, yeah, I've had a wonderful time. Okay, thank you so much. All the best to you, and the same to you. Bye. Bye bye.